My name is Joshua Makabuag. I'm acting chair of the of EFIT, the Earthwork Engineering Field Investigation Team. Um, and the most important thing is to say thank you to all of the attendees that are here to, to listen to the presentation. And thank you very much for the team that are going to be presenting. And the lecture that we're giving this evening is on the recent Aegean earthquake and tsunami that affected uh, both Greece and, uh, and Turkey. I'll let Yasmin and team explain the event, but I'll just very quickly explain EFIT. Um, we are a team of building sector professionals from both industry and academia. If you just Google the term EFIT, E-E-F-I-T, and the iStruct T, you'll come across our website and you'll see reports from these kinds of missions over the past several decades, pulling out the key learning points uh, for the engineering um, and disaster risk management uh, communities um, for these key events. So I would encourage everybody to look at that. And if anybody is interested in joining a mission like this, um, in going overseas to understand these lessons, and even in these cases of during COVID, uh, managing to do this work remotely, um, if anybody is interested in doing that and being part of um, this team, then do get in touch um, because um, you know we're all interested in, in being part of making something um, that has an impact. So over to Yasmin to take us through um, her description of the journey of their team to understand the key lessons from the Aegean earthquake. Over to you, Yasmin. Uh, thank you very much, Josh. Uh, yes, welcome everyone. Uh, it is our great honor to be hosting you this evening for the Aegean Earthquake and Tsunami Mission uh, Lecture. Uh, as you know, on the 30th of October, at around 3 Turkish time and 2 uh, Greek time in the afternoon, an earthquake of magnitude 6.9 hit the Turkish and Greek Aegean coastline, um, causing also a tsunami. The, event, the epicenter of the event was 14 kilometers northeast of the Greek island Samos and some 32 kilometers southwest of Seferihisar in Turkey. The event was followed by around 4,500 aftershocks uh, and 50, around 50 of these was greater than magnitude 4. Various, various sources reported the depth for the earthquake ranging between 10 and uh, 21 kilometers. The event caused two casualties in Samos and two, uh, 117 in Turkey one of whom was in Seferihisar due to tsunami impact. The remaining, remaining Turkish casualties concentrated in uh, the city of Izmir, a metropolitan city which was around 65 kilometers away from the epicenter with an average population density nearly 60 times that of Samos. The number of hospitalized people due to serious injuries was also much higher in Turkey. The estimated losses due to the event are um, 81 million uh, euros for Samos and uh, for only insured losses around 190 million euros for Turkey. Uh, for this mission, we have worked as a rather large team organized, as you can see here, under seven main areas and with a substantial support group. Uh, this is us, if you wanted to put a face to the names. Uh, in this instance, due to COVID-related travel restrictions, we were unable to launch a field-based mission, as in the model conventionally used for reconnaissance activities. However, we've been extremely lucky to partner up with a brilliant local field crew, two people from Turkey, Anul and Esther here, and two from Greece to support the, the Martha and Panos uh, to support the remote mission activities with field investigations. If you wanted to know more about our field crew, you can visit our uh, block uh, site here. Uh, so very quickly, our mission objectives can be summarized as follows. Uh, firstly, we aim to combine field and remote survey strategies for assessment of damage to buildings and critical infrastructure and to geote geotechnical structures. Uh, secondly, to investigate the extent in which other data sources can be used for remote reconnaissance in support of field work. Uh, and of course, this event was a very rare and valuable event because it also included a tsunami. And therefore, we aim to um, carry out a systematic and comparative analysis of the impact of earthquake and tsunami over a wide geographic area. Again, we, we, uh, we aim to develop an understanding as to how the EFIT's mobile app can be tailored to address the specificities of this event. And finally, uh, to develop a multi-stakeholder understanding of the event and of its impacts through a public survey and a number of interviews with a range of professionals from Turkey and Greece. So it was a very big endeavor covering two countries and two hazards under the umbrella of one mission. Again, very quickly, our mission diary. It's been exactly one month since we started our work. 
with, uh, as you can see, three sets of uh, field investigations, some other studies in the, the interviews and, and remote data assessments. After the mission lecture here, uh, where we are aiming to present our preliminary findings, we will be working on the data analysis until we release the preliminary report in around January, hopefully, and the final report and other materials on the mission from March onwards. Uh, we have so much to cover today, so before further ado, this is the structure we're going to cover, follow, uh, we're going to uh, follow for tonight's lecture. Uh, and I'd like to leave the floor to my colleague, Aisling, for uh, seismic tectonics and geological background. Hi, everyone. I'm Aisling. I'm a third year of PhD student at the University of Cambridge, and I'll give you a brief outline of the seismic tectonics and geological background of the region affected by the June earthquake. Here, um, as mentioned previously, the earthquake occurred in um, the GNC which is part of a rapidly deforming region known as the Alpine Himalayan Belt, which stretches east-west across the globe from the Mediterranean to Indonesia. The topographic map on the left from Temaz et al. nicely illustrates the neotectonics of the region, which is governed by the relative motions of three major plates, the African, Arabian and Eurasian, and two microplates, the Aegean and Anatolian, in the centre. The Aegean is dominated by both strike-slip and extensional motion, the northward subduction of the African plate beneath the Aegean and western Turkey causes extension in the overriding Aegean plate which, within which the, Saz the Samos earthquake occurred. Along with strikes that motion um, along the North Alantonian and East Al Anatolian fault zones, this causes an overall westward motion of Turkey relative to Eurasia. Here um, I will just I'll not dwell too much on the geology because this will be discussed later in, um, in relation to the areas with the highest ground motions. But what we can see here is that even on a local scale, you can see a, a huge variability in the types of deposits and uh, local geology, essentially. Here we can see east-west trending faults across um, Samos, the island of Samos, as well as northeast southwest trending faults um, close to the region of Izmir, um, many of which extend into Kusadai Bay. I've annotated an example of soft soil deposits, i.e. basin fill or alluvial deposits, which, were, which are known to amplify ground motions and cause most of the damage to the structures. Here on the left, I show GPS velocities relative to Eurasia from the Nuket and England tile catalogues. The arrows represent how fast the region is moving, i.e. if the arrow is longer, the area is moving faster, and what we can see here is that the average extension rates across the Aegean is on the order of 20 to 60 milli, uh, millimetres a year. The average velocities for the area local to the earthquake, however, are roughly around 30 to 40 mil um, a year relative to Eurasia. On the, on the right hand figure, we can see a recent study done by Wise et al, where they produced a stream rate model across Anatolia. And essentially the areas in red and yellow on the right hand figure show areas that are undergoing high strain. And it nicely picks out Izmir as one of these regions. The map by Kassars et al on the left shows historical seismicity across the Aegean. And I know you can barely see any features in the map, but this, this was the whole point of it. This area is one of the most seismically active areas in the, in the world, and there are frequent moderately sized earthquakes, and at times can be episodic, such as the 2009 cluster of earthquakes across the Samos Kusadai region. This is because there are many active faults where you can see um, Kassara's corresponding active fault map of the region. And what I've done is I've taken the extents of this map and plotted the number of earthquakes since 1900 sorted by magnitude. I filtered this just for crustal earthquakes, i.e. those less than 35 kilometers for the Aegean, as these are the ones that are most important to us and cause the most damage. They're shown in the green uh, bars on the bottom right hand corner. Here I show a focal mechanism map of the Aegean for crustal earthquakes. Again, these are the shallow earthquakes and those that are large enough to cause sufficient damage. So I've capped a minimum magnitude of five. To non-seismologists, these focal mechanisms may just look like beach balls, but I've put a key on the bottom right-hand corner for the different mechanisms so you can try and follow along. They help us to constrain the spatial distribution of the types of faulting across the region. Here we can see an aseismic region in the centre of the Aegean, shown by the gap um, in earthquakes. 
we see normal folding in mainland Greece and in the Eastern Aegean Greek islands, where the focal mechanism is white in the centre. Um, we see strike slip folding in the North Aegean, shown by the crisscross pattern and the focal mechanism. And lastly, we see thrust fault, uh, thrust folding in the Hellenic Arc, which is in the southwest of the map. Here I show local seismicity close to the earthquake location. The event itself, um, the October event, is highlighted in blue. Again, we can say this is a seismically active area and has had a history of devastating earthquakes, such as the 1904 magnitude 6.8 and the 1955 magnitude 6.9 earthquakes. This is because there are many large northeast, southwest and east-west trending faults across western Turkey um, near Izmir, which is important because Izmir has a population in excess of 4 million people. And there are many east-west trending uh, faults across Samos, and five that have been determined to have the earthquake potential of magnitude 6.3 to 6.9. One of these five faults is the North Samos Fault, which is located 10 kilometers north of the island of Samos and dips northwards at roughly 45 degrees. It was on this fault that ruptured during the 30th October earthquake. Here I show a minimum misfit solution uh, of telescopic body waveform modeling of the earthquake. This is just a technique that has helped better constrain uh, the earthquake parameters. It was performed by Professor James Jackson at the University of Cambridge, um, who modeled the event as a finite duration rupture by conducting joint inversion from long period P seismic waveforms, as shown on the right, and SH seismic waveforms using the Swicketal MT5 program based on McCaffrey's um, algorithm. From this, we can determine the centroid depth of roughly around seven kilometers, which means that the earthquake would have ruptured from the surface to 14 kilometers in depth. The segment that it ruptured was roughly 33 kilometers long. And what we can tell um, in terms of the amount of slip was roughly two meters of depth, but we can see up to 35 centimeters of displacement at the surface. Here I'll um, finalize by showing you a couple of the observations we made in the field, well, not us, our collaborators in the field. Um, we show that the firstly surface rupturing, mainly in northwest Samos, which were semi-continuous for up to a kilometre and caused up to 30 centimetres of offset. Um, most of these ruptures strike northeast southwest, which is parallel um, with the local stream direction and quite close to the Karlovasi fault um, in that region. We also noted that there was uh, changes in the Samos coastline, um, particularly done well by Leka Sital in a recent study, and they noted Eight, between 8 and 35 centimetres of uplift along the Samus coast. This is not uncommon to the Aegean, however, because other authors have noted similar styles of deformation across the Mediterranean, such as the Gulf of Corinth or the Ionian Islands. Hi all from Istanbul. Uh, I am PhD candidate uh, at Boğaziçi University Kandil Observatory uh, Earthquake Engineering Department. Uh, I'll try to explain the strong ground motion characterization of Aegean Sea earthquake. Uh, as we look to spatial distribution of strong ground motion networks in the uh, eastern part of the epicenter, we can see well distributed stations. Uh, and also two stations in the summit gave a chance to uh, receive records from the south of the epicenter. Uh, however, one considers the proximity of the fault and seismicity of the region. Uh, stations in Samos may be increased to obtain more near field records for the future earthquakes. Uh, in this study, we limited the maximum source to station distance to 200 kilometers, and the majority of the data uh, comes from the attack. Uh, peak ground accelerations can be a, a key indicator for damage, especially uh, when correlated with soil conditions and distance. Uh, for Asian Sea earthquake, uh, as expected, uh, the maximum PGA was observed at the closest distances as about 0.2 G. Uh, also, I want to mention other three stations, which is located on the uh, most severe damaged area, Bayrakland Karşıyaka. Uh, two of them uh, are on the soft soils with the VSTORT value lower than 200 meter per second, and you can see on the left. Uh, also, we are lucky uh, for comparison of the PGS for soft and stiff soil because we have another station in the same area uh, with really high VSTORTIV value, and uh, you can see on the right that. 
Uh, so we can observe twofold PGA in the soft soil record uh, as a basic indicator of soil amplification. If we look via starter distribution in detail, we can divide the station soils into three classes based on your uh, The majority of the data is mainly accumulated in soil class B. Uh, in order to evaluate uh, the attenuation characteristics of observed data with distance, we compare them with three recent GMPs, and uh, they are mainly within the two sigma range. Uh, also, at the closest distances, geometrical mean of observed PGAs is highly compatible to uh, empirical PGA curves. For soil class B, uh, C and D, at greater distances, especially uh, after 80 km, observed PGA values start to decay faster with the distance. Uh, another important point is related to most damage area, even the basin PGA seems a little bit uh, underpredicted in this curve. And uh, now we can focus on spectral accelerations for one second of period. Uh, at greater distances, similar to PGA, uh, we can see fast attenuation effects in soft soil class. Again, for soft soil class, SA uh, of basin records exceeds the median line and uh, really approach to the two sigma line. Uh, and there is interesting thing in stiff soil SAs, uh, unlike PGA, uh, SAs are above the median line. Uh, before next slide, please follow the data between circle in this soil class. And now you can see the data in the circles positioned on the median line again. So uh, that's why we wanted to see the variation of spectral acceleration uh, for a larger period, range of period. Uh, now uh, for these records, you can see the observed and empirical response spectra uh, up to four seconds. Uh, and it is detected that uh, peak of empirical spectral accelerations occur at the shorter period than observed ones. Uh, in other words, interestingly, for this object, these stiff soil records uh, present larger assays at the longer periods than empirically expected ones, and this is really important for the buildings between these period ranges. Uh, as for the seismic hazards of the region, uh, the last earthquake hazard map of Turkey gives higher PJ and PGV values for uh, 475 years of return period uh, than observed values. Uh, that is really good. However, we should point out the closest distances because uh, both observed PJ and PGV is really close to uh, values of the hazard map. Uh, so for future earthquakes, earthquakes, this issue should be regarded. Uh, in order to understand whether uh, seismic codes uh, are responsible for the damage in the area, uh, observed spectral accelerations were compared with elastic design spectra in the current and earlier versions of seismic codes. Uh, many buildings in the region were constructed in 1990s, so probably with the design principles of 1975 seismic code. Uh, this code takes into account uh, 1972 donation map and is very corresponds to uh, seismic zone one. Uh, also 2007 codes consider the similar seismic zone. Uh, as for 2018, seismic zonation map amounted to a uh, torque short cake hazard map and we can obtain a site specific design basis response spectra. Uh, so for this close to stiff soil record, at several specific periods, observed SAs exceed uh, all calculated design spectra uh, correspond to their soil classes. Uh, if we examine the records from SOMOS, we use two different codes, Greek code and Eurocode uh, Euro 8. Uh, SOMOS falls into zone 2 based on Greek zonation map, so similar to closest station in Turkey, uh, observed spectral accelerations from two stations in SOMOS uh, exceeds the design spectrum at 0.5 seconds, uh, which is important for medium rise RC building. And now we can move to the soft soil records, Bayraklı and Karşıyaka, also most damaged area. Uh, we have interesting result. Uh, although we observe severe damage in these regions, design conditions meet the earthquake demand, even if in outdated 1975 seismic code. These results lead to uh, think about the reason of damage. Uh, you will have more information in the structural section, but 
uh, Professor Erdik mentioned previously, uh, poor code compliance and inadequate construction inspections may be the uh, primary reason of the, this uh, destruction. Uh, also, I want to highlight another issue in this slide. Uh, the flat region of the 2018 design spectrum begins at lower periods and its width uh, is really shorter than the observed one for Bayraktı. And this phenomena is really uh, important for buildings within these period ranges. Uh, when considered the geotechnical conditions of uh, these soft basin soils and uh, capacity of producing large magnitude events uh, of the fault in the region, uh, for future earthquakes, these differences uh, should be regarded uh, maybe via site specific studies. Thank you. Thank you, Fatma. May I invite Ruhola to give the te geotechnical observations talk now, please? Yes, thank you. Good evening, everyone. My name is Ruhola Rustavi, and I'm a PhD student at Glasgow Caledonian University. I'm uh, focused on the geotechnical observation. So, the first slide shows that the two maps that from USGS, that's the, the potential area for the land slide, as you can see in the left side, that's the Sajahari and also the Gumuda, and also in north of the Samus Island. And the right uh, one shows the potential for the area for the liquefaction, as you can see in the, in the board, coastline for the Esmir and some area in the Komodor and also in Kushadazi and slightly in the Wati of the Samos Island. You can see that in this uh, some uh, image for the ground cracks that's the, in the road we found in various parts of the road network. Uh, actually the, the road network didn't show significant damage, but the ground cracks observed in area in the, you can see the North Island, the Agnus Nicholas and the Kurovasi and Kukari, as you can see, uh, but limited lo uh, local problem in the road network due to the, this crack. In various uh, parts of the island, mainly in the northern part, in a stabilized of the rock and soil slopes were identified. Uh, this phenomena led to problems in the road network, as you can see, in the, such as the Avalokya. And, uh, but after that, uh, a concrete barrier made of the large concrete block has been created along the base of the affected slope in order to uh, protect the road from further slope failures. Also, the rock fields were targeted by this earthquake is in the several sites. As you can see, that's the, uh, also the generator in Akria Island, located in the western of the Samos. A limited number of the rock fields were observed in the uh, Esmir area. Uh, just uh, in the place in the Kushada Sea. Uh, but the, the part of the Esme is the character by favorable condition for the generation of the soup, including mainly rock field. But no any uh, rock field uh, reported in this area. As you can see, the, uh, despite the event a specific liquefaction targeting prediction on the USGS map, as shown in here as well. No service uh, of the soil liquefaction was seen in this uh, Esmir area, but just uh, in some place in form of the signposts were observed. And also, uh, but in mostly in the Samus Island, in Malagari of the Samus, as you can see in form of the uh, signposts you can see. But uh, extensive images were observed mainly in the ports of the northern part of the Samos Island. As you can see, I specify a port in Karwasi and two ports in Wati and uh, Kokari. The formation of the port uh, detected due to, to combination of the dynamic consolidation of the bedrock field soil material and also potential near service for the liquid faction. 
yeah, possible horizontal spread of the soil onto the sea as well. As my colleague said, that the most effect area is the bi That's the our friend the structure team will explain in more detail. But just I'm looking focus on the uh, site response and soil condition. The first uh, uh, in the left side top, you can see the uh, the typical soil of selected uh, residential area, and it shows that the uh, deep alluvial soil layer. And uh, the groundwater table in the Bayrakli is one to three deep. And based on the report, and you can see in the geological map, uh, it can be understood that the Bayrakli is sitting on the thick aeolian uh, uh, layer. Also, the bottom the left, you can see the VS the team that's the showed also the Bayrakli. Uh, in this area, in this the uh, is lower than 130 means the again the confirm that is very soft ground. Uh, also, that's that means the level of the, the ground is uh, one to three and soil, all over soil and is potential for the liquidfaction. However, no any liquidfaction uh, reported for the damage in the this area, but. Uh, we also analyze the, uh, you can see that the base, uh, the two station close to the, this area, the station 3513, that's so uh, VS30 is 196, mean the, in the soil, uh, soft soil, and also the next one also the, the, in the uh, right base that you can see, yeah, you can compare. These two, the first one, if you like, the PGA level is about uh, uh, 106 centimeter per meter square, and this one as well is the uh, 57. And you can see that compared to also the frequency for these two area. Yeah, the, both in this uh, the horizontal and vertical the ratio of the show the uh, in this area show the amplification and you can see that for the uh, 4.8 for the 1.8 second period and also for the 5.5 for the uh, 2.5 also spectral you can see uh, due to the amplification uh, and also when you comp comparing uh, this uh, with the comparison accelerator <coughs> spectra recorded for the ground motion. And these two, by right, in these two uh, stations, you can see that for soft soil is uh, 2.5 uh, 2. higher than the right base. And this is also true for the amplification. And in this uh, area, higher the amplification. But as I said, it's noted no liquid fraction observed in this area, but uh, this the soil, local soil and dynamic soil con uh, construction interactions must, may have a play, particularly averaging role in the seismic behavior of this the structure and more investigation need for that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rahola. Uh, this concludes the uh, seismotectonics and geotechnics uh, section, and we start talking about the structures a bit. Uh, I'm going to talk about the planning of the, the fieldwork uh, a bit first. The planning of the fieldwork, of course, uh, required some investigations to be able to make sure uh, that we were using our limited resources on the field in a strategically correct fashion and not seeking answers to questions already answered by that point. Uh, our main compass in planning the, the fieldwork in Turkey was the extent of coverage and outcome of the comprehensive damage assessment work that the, um, the Turkish Ministry of Environment and Urbanization had carried out within a rather short amount of time following the, the event. Uh, their assessment coverage and outcomes are summarized in this graph, which we developed based on the ministry's public database. As you can see here, the navy dotted line shows the, the coverage. Uh, and we can see that apart from the Bayraklı and Bornova and perhaps Karşıyaka and Karaburun uh, districts, the coverage is actually pretty low. 
Uh, this is because, as, as explained before, most of the dramatic structural damage was observed in these neighborhoods, while all total uh, collapses and casualties actually took place in Bayraklı. We also note from this plot that the, uh, the, the coverage is very much proportional to the density of these, these districts, uh, as, as, as can be seen from the uh, red dotted line, uh, perhaps with the exception of Konak here. Uh, which is a central Izmir neighborhood, which has been covered very little, despite being the highest density, density district uh, by far. Uh, as you can see, while 90,000 buildings were assessed in Bayraklı and Bornova, in certain districts, the number of assessed buildings can be as low as one. Uh, here you are seeing Bayraklı actually, uh, and, and, and the big contrast, contrast of its coverage um, is, is, is rather um, obvious from this map. Um, so considering this and also uh, considering the practicalities around travel, in the end, we ended up with this itinerary. Esar and Anol, our, our Turkish field crew, started from Kuşadası, which was one of the nearest locations in Turkey to the epicenter, uh, but hadn't been covered at all by the, the Turkish Ministry of Environment and Urbanization. Uh, then they moved to Sajik Akarja and Seferi Hisar to observe damage due to tsunami, which uh, hadn't been looked into by the ministry. And on the third day, we moved to this, um, uh, this uh, southwest part of Izmir to cover the least covered neighborhoods in this, these five districts, Güzel Bahçe, Narlıdere, Balçova, Karabağlar and Buca. Uh, the fourth day, we uh, we dedicated entirely to Konak, which is, as I said, uh, the, the densest uh, district in uh, all of Izmir, but also is home to monumental structures and public structures. And we knew that the ministry really covered quite few public structures by that point. And, uh, and the last day, Eser and Anul went to Chile in northeast Izmir to observe building damage in the largest industrial area in the whole region. Uh, they also spent some time uh, on day five uh, in two most adversely affected neighborhoods, Bayrakla and Karşiyaka. Uh, here, in parentheses, you are seeing the number of buildings assessed for earthquake impact here, uh, or a combined impact of earthquake and tsunami. In total, we had um, 309 buildings field, field assessed in Turkey. Um, in case of Greece, on the other hand, our itinerary was mostly determined by where our Greek field crew was based in. Martha, who was originally from Samos City, uh, covered mostly Samos City, Wathi and Kokari, while, while uh, Panos, who is, who is originally from Karlovasi, uh, covered the uh, more the western villages and settlements. Uh, Panos and, and Martha also took lots of pictures from the field for the rest of the team to remote assess in the, in the UK. In total, we uh, had 215 buildings uh, field assessed and an additional almost 100 uh, pictures were collected uh, by them. In both Turkey and Greece, our field crews were advised not to cherry pick damage, to target a good cross section of structural systems, age and occupancy types in line with the building stocks, and of course, to take safety above all. Uh, of course, one of the outcomes of carrying out this activity in the midst of a pandemic uh, was that all buildings uh, were assessed from outside, uh, unless, of course, these were collapsed in a way to expose the indoors. Uh, this is, of course, something which has some important implications technically, which we will briefly discuss uh, in the end. Um, Apart from the pics that our field crew collected for us to remote assess, we also benefited from a number of remote data sources. As I mentioned, the Turkish Ministry of Environment and Urbanization database, Facebook, the, uh, the Turkish, the Turkey's Izmir Provincial Coordination Board, which is really um, a joint body established by a number of professional chambers, like Chambers of Architects, Chamber of Architects, Chamber of Structural Engineers, etc. Um, Twitter, YouTube, uh, Izmir uh, uh, Metropolitan Municipality and EMSC. We also uh, received great help from individuals who donated their archives to us and the previous reports. Uh, this map shows the data sources for those assessments that we have carried out so far. Uh, as you can see, there is quite a lot of richness in there. We still have an immense amount of material which will keep us busy in the coming weeks. Uh, but yeah, but before moving to the outcomes of our uh, damage assessment, 
uh, we'd like to talk a little bit about how we did the field and remote assessment. So I'm leaving the floor to my colleague Valentina. Um, good evening, all, and thanks, Yasemin. Yasemin. I'm Valentina Putrino, um, IFIT member and research assistant at UCL. And I'm going to focus on the tool used on site to gather damage data, as defined as IFIT mobile app. The tool is one of the outputs of the Learning from Earthquake UK project founded by the APSRC and carried out as a joint project between three main universities, namely UCL, University of Cambridge, and University of Newcastle. The app, of which you can see a glimpse on the left side of the screen, uses an existing library of functionalities called Device Magic and is built following a series of flowcharts which follow the tier assessment rationale. This means that depending on how much time the user is allowed to spend on site, the app allows to collect damage data which are commensurate and they do not repeat themselves across the various tiers whilst gathering each su successive tier an increasingly detailed level of information. The app has currently been tested in other IFIT missions among which the Albania mission launched after the 26th of November 2019 earthquake and the first ever made remote mission after the March 2020 earthquake in Zagreb, Croatia. The novelty of this current mission relates to the inclusion of a tsunami da damage assessment module within the already widely developed seismic damage assessment module. That's why we refer to it uh, in to this more comprehensive version as version 2.0. The mobile app liaises closely with another tool defined as SDI, which stands for Spatial Data Infrastructure for Data Managing and Mapping, which has been used to receive the original data from the users on site, and it's being developed further to support the automatic creation of maps. More detailed information on both tools will be provided during the next second IFIT joint lecture set to happen in January 2020, details of which will be provided at the end of this current lecture. Here is the map indicating precisely the location of each submission sent by our local teams. The numbers clearly show the advantage brought by the use of the eFeed mobile app, both in terms of speed of data gathering, data management, data quality, and data organization. From the flowchart used to build the eFeed mobile app, a resembling form was built to allow the remote team to conduct secondary damage assessment to verify the primary assessment conducted by the field team and also primary assessment done completely from remote of other buildings, such as from other extra pictures taken from the support team on site and other remote data sources mentioned earlier by Yasin. That's all from me. Thank you. Thank you, Valentina. Thank you. Uh, may I invite Marco then to speak about the tsunami impact now, please? Hello, I'm Marco Baiguera, a research fellow in earthquake and tsunami engineering at UCL. And um, I will give you uh, some preliminary observation, a presentation of some preliminary uh, observations on tsunami impacts um, in, uh, in the region affected by the uh, earthquake and tsunami. Uh, the uh, earthquake occurred um, under the shallow waters between the Greek island of Samos and the coast of Turkey. Um, the, sun, the sudden downward slip of one of the fault blocks caused the uh, seafloor to drop, and therefore a uh, tsunami. Um, the impact um, um, was concentrated mainly in the uh, four districts uh, highlighted on the map uh, of Turkey. Um, and uh, I would say uh, in the two central ones, uh, Orla district and uh, Severisa, um, there was no mass damage um, uh, recorded as well in Turkey, uh, 
Um, on the island of Samos, uh, which was the closest uh, to uh, the uh, epicenter, there was uh, some um, um, damage and uh, also impact of the uh, uh, of the tsunami on the uh, coastal um, areas. And um, if we look in the next slide uh, at the um, tsunami inundation that had been measured uh, following the event by different teams uh, on the ground, uh, we can see that the uh, wave uh, reached a uh, tsunami that in some locations affected by the tsunami uh, approximately or from uh, uh, 0.5 to even uh, uh, two meters in some places and um, and uh, probably uh, following the event, you have seen some of the uh, videos that are shown, some of the frames shown in the next slide. Um, and uh, in, these, um, uh, in these videos, it was quite clear that uh, the uh, tsunami, which is uh, re uh, quite a rare event in the Mediterranean, was quite a substantial flooding of the, uh, for some locations, especially uh, Sikachik in, the, in, the, in Turkey, and also on the uh, island of Samos, in particular the two uh, towns of Vati and Kalovasi. Now, if you look at the uh, arrival times of the wave, uh, we can definitely see that, especially um, in Kalovasi, uh, the time uh, uh, the, the tsunami arrived after very few uh, minutes uh, of the earthquake. And this uh, is a video from a um, uh, house that is, um, in a location that is probably one of the closest to the um, epicenter uh, to you know, the earthquake. And um, he, um, this video provides a, a real time uh, description of the uh, wave arrival. Um, in the, in, and in a, this is like a, a, the frame after one minute and then after two minutes. We can see that just after two minutes, the earthquake, after the earthquake, the uh, sea. Uh, uh, receded, and um, later on, uh, after uh, four minutes, um, and actually this is confirmed by the um, METO, um, um, it's validated by the METO simulation of the tsunami, and then in the next slide we can see that uh, uh, there is a first wave arriving at this um, beach in, uh, in uh, Kalovasi, and, uh, and finally, uh, after just four minutes of the uh, earthquake, uh, there is a big, uh, more uh, impactful uh, wave uh, that, um, and in the next slide, we can see the um, wave uh, getting into the house and with a run up height of uh, calculated around or over three meters. So um, you can definitely see that. Uh, there was no much time, especially for the island of uh, Samos, uh, of, um, to have some warning. Uh, and um, we focused our mission, as mentioned earlier by uh, Yasmin, uh, on the locations where uh, the evidence from uh, previous reports and uh, videos and you know, also photographic evidence indicated us that uh, there was some uh, substantial um, uh, impact. Um, after a month, uh, the uh, field team went to uh, Sigacik. That um, was uh, in, affected by uh, the uh, tsunami, both in the marina, but also in the uh, city center, um, where after a month there was just uh, water uh, marks on the walls. No major damage was actually uh, recorded. Um, in the nearby location, um, the photos uh, down um, in the slides uh, as a nearby location where there was some uh, damage of uh, two perimeter walls of the um, houses uh, near to the beach. Um, the interesting thing is that in this area that is quite close to the epicenter um, compared to Izmir, there was no recorded um, structural damage due to the earthquake. So the uh, tsunami flooding was quite... Uh, uh, sustained, but at the same time did not cause any structural damage, but there was no even uh, earthquake damage. So um, it was more damage to the contents and to, as we are going to see in the next slide, 
to um, uh, the uh, marina uh, of Sigacik, um, where um, as in other places in Turkey, uh, many boats were uh, damaged uh, or even sunk. And that's uh, led to many insurance claims around four, four, around 40 boats that sunk and 40 fleet that uh, ran aground. And um, there is another location where the field mission uh, um, actually went to near Sigacik uh, is um, just looking at some videos we uh, saw uh, that uh, there was quite a sustained uh, fl a tsunami flow that uh, eventually uh, led to the collapse of a, a very weak wall. Uh, actually, the reason why uh, we can we see uh, sustained flow in this location is also because um, this area was built over uh, the inlet of a river, and therefore uh, the, um, uh, the water was uh, easily channeled into this um, uh, river. And uh, in the next slide, um, we'll see instead some of the observations from the island of Samos. Um, the uh, main difference is that here in Samos we have buildings that were actually affected more by the earthquake. Um, and therefore this building was then um, impacted by the tsunami inundation. Apparently, uh, what we believe is that the tsunami didn't cause any particular damage uh, in terms of the structures. Uh, but uh, again, uh, this is a um, let's say slightly different uh, picture from uh, the um, Turkish uh, coast. So these are the main uh, preliminary observations from uh, regarding the tsunami impact. So thank you. Thank you very much, Marco. Um, uh, so now we would like to move to the building stocks, typologies and damage, which um, is going to be um, covered by Danai, Marianna and myself. Uh, Danai. Yes, hello. I'm Danai and uh, I'm a, I collaborate with National Capital Eastern University of Athens as a researcher. I'm going to talk about the building uh, stock and damage patterns we observed in Samos. Uh, according to the latest census, we can see that half of the buildings, almost half of the building stock in uh, uh, Samos is made by reinforced concrete and uh, built in different uh, construction periods, mainly in the 70s and 80s. And the other half is uh, of different masonry typologies. Uh, earlier built earlier than 1960s. It's interesting to see the spatial distribution of uh, construction material along the island. If we focus to the reinforced concrete material uh, buildings, we see that they're mostly concentrated to the urban settlements and to the uh, coastal, more touristic ones. It's interesting to mention also the drop of population in Samos after 2001, what is uh, well compatible with a large number of abandoned buildings that were significantly affected by the, the earthquake. And uh, lastly, I'd like to mention the terraced character of buildings in olden um, uh, in the in both old and uh, newer environment in uh, Samos that uh, uh, were determined that was determinant of the of the damage patterns in several cases. Now about the damage and usability statistics. On your left hand side, you can see the. Uh, usability assessments of the engineers of the ministry. This is data that was released by the 8th of December by the Ministry of Infrastructure in Greece and um, it, it's usability characterization after second degree inspection uh, by, by the engineers. I uh, should note that uh, second degree inspection takes place after the completion of the first uh, degree that occurs um, rapidly after the, the event and the uh, second degree is also after the homeowner uh, takes place uh, after homeowner's uh, request. Uh, on the right hand side we have mapped uh, remote and uh, field assessments uh, that were performed uh, during this uh, this mission, you can see that we try to cover as much as possible um, different locations of uh, locations of interest throughout the island, with a uh, special focus to the um, to the largest towns of Karlovas and Vathy. And from the uh, pie attached, you can see that uh, the damage grades observed are uh, different, actually. 
Focusing now to the uh, damaged and masonry buildings. Uh, first of all, I'd like to say that here I'm going to talk about the stone masonry, the traditional stone masonry buildings, as Yasmin will present later, uh, the vernacular typologies that were uh, commonly found in uh, Samos and Izmir that were uh, made by uh, stone and uh, timber frames. So the collapse of these buildings was mostly limited to old um, all structures abandoned and, and poor uh, maintenance conditions and different damage patterns were observed. We saw out of plane failure of uh, walls due to bad connection of the of the walls uh, of the walls uh, due, to, uh, of, due to bad connection of the walls with the uh, with the roof and the diagram uh, due to bad um, quality mortar that led to a separation of the two whites. Uh, we also uh, saw several diagonal cracks in the piers and spandrels and the walls of um, cracks were of different width and extent. Uh, we saw uh, roof damages and even uh, collapse of several roofs and corner failures. Uh, about the most interesting damage patterns in uh, um, reinforced concrete buildings, uh, as expected, most of the damage is in infill, in infill walls, in plane or out of plane. Uh, but we observed also uh, some uh, failures of BIM column joints as a result of uh, soft story mechanisms. Uh, mechanism. Uh, at this moment, I would like to mention the regular buildings that um, are numerous in uh, in Samos and in Greece in general, uh, uh, especially with regards to regularity in elevation, since uh, pilotis and uh, stores are often located at the ground level. Uh, interesting was also uh, the, were also the cases of uh, short columns that we observed. And last but not least, I uh, would like to talk about the damage to this uh, uh, special uh, structural family and probably I should have started with this since it was the, it seems to have been the mostly affected in uh, in Samos. Around 70 churches, chapels and monasteries were severely damaged, some of them even beyond repair. We have selected some of the most, uh, let's say, impressive uh, uh, damages of the largest earthquake um, uh, churches. Uh, we saw collapse of the roof and the um, uh, facades. We saw uh, severe damage of the um, uh, of the large domes. And I would like to mention at this point that uh, smaller churches uh, that were even older but uh, compact seem to have suffered less in this earthquake. Uh, lastly, uh, monuments that were not left intact either were the uh, Castle of Pythagorio and the listed industrial buildings of the old tenories at Kerlovasi. That was all for me now. The floor to Mariana that's going to present its mayor. Thank you, Danai. Uh, good evening, everyone. So I'm Mariana Ercolino, senior lecturer at the University of Greenwich, and I will show you in the next slides the preliminary results of the damage assessment we performed in the city of Izmir, and in particular with the reference to the earthquake action only. Before looking at the response of the buildings, I just want to stress that we are going to look at the building stock that it was mainly built between the 1980 and the 2000, and we are mainly uh, assessing uh, RC structures or enforced concrete structures and major buildings. When we studied uh, and assessed the city of Izmir, we found a very populated area with mostly residential buildings so with an increase of commercial activities, industrial buildings after the 2012. If we move to the next slide, uh, so we see that uh, in the, um, so uh, what we saw so far is that uh, um, we uh, found uh, a, um, an event that happened quite far away from its mirrors. So, uh, and uh, we found that the recorded seismic uh, intensities were actually in the range of the design values uh, or even smaller. So when we designed and actually planned uh, the itinerary of our mission, as Yasmin said, we were actually looking to create a database that uh, was then complemented to what we uh, already found in other databases and data sets from other sources. So, for example, in this slide on the left side, you have the map of Izmir with the distribution of the heavily damaged buildings that were already assessed by the Turkish ministry. And uh, uh, instead, on the right side, you can see the map of the buildings that we assessed during our field mission. So, you can see how we are actually filling all the areas that were less investigated. And also, we are looking at both buildings with good behavior and also end behaviors, you know, severe 
the images. So in particular, if we focus on the map with the distribution of the damage, we can see that we had an overall good behavior. As also, we can see from the pie chart at the top of this slide. So actually, most of the buildings uh, had no damage or very little damage, so DG0, DG1 damage state. And this is for sure something that is uh, uh, re uh, true for the RC structures, uh, uh, like medium or low rise buildings used for residential uh, use and also industrial and commercial buildings that instead were uh, hosted in precast reinforced concrete buildings. So uh, if instead we move to uh, the more severe damage, the more severe damage was mainly recorded for two reasons. So in the next slide, we can see that the first reason is for sure the collapse of the non-structural components. So as in the case of the infill walls you have in the picture on the right side of the slide, and the second reason instead is due to the degradation of the material, so no maintenance in structures and also pre-existing damage in the structural elements. If instead we look at the behavior of the measured structures, we have an exceptionally good response. So we found no damage in religious and historical buildings and also in public and residential structures. So this overall good performance that we found is somehow in contrast instead with the collapses that we recorded in some in some regions and some areas of Izmir. So in the next slide, please, we can actually see that we saw 21 buildings collapsing. And those buildings are mainly concentrated in the west side of Izmir, and in particular in two districts that you have in the in this map, so Baragli and Bornova. And uh, moreover, amongst these 21 buildings, only nine of them are worth further investigations because they are the buildings that actually caused most of the casualties since they are multi story structures, hosting residential apartments and commercial activities. Those buildings, as you can see from the map on the right, are actually all in Baragli and, and they are all located in the south part in two specific neighborhoods. So those buildings are for sure becoming case studies. And what we can do tonight, we can already look at some of them to understand the possible reasons of their catastrophic failures. So if we move to the next slide, for example, I can show you the uh, first case study. In this case, we have um, so uh, we have the case of an eight-story building that was built in the 1990, and it's an RC frame building that completely collapsed because of the earthquake, killing 14 people. The reason of the collapse of this structure can be found in uh, for example, the amplification of the seismic action due to the soil characteristics, as we saw in the presentation by Rohola. But we have to consider the, also the possible effect of pre existing damage in the structure. Uh, we actually have a report in 2018 telling us that the structure had severe damage because of past earthquakes. And so this has to be further investigated to understand how, what is the effect of this pre-existing damage on the failure. Uh, this is also a plausible reason, because if you look at the map on the right, you can see that uh, the Douglas apartment, uh, so the purple one, collapsed, while the, uh, closed, uh, the closed buildings in the same map actually had no damage or very little damage, even if they are buildings with more or less the same age, same material, and same number of stories. A similar conclusion can be also given, uh, can be also um, uh, used for the next uh, case studies. So other two buildings, again, eight, nine stories collapsing again in the Barakli, uh, uh, completely killing people. And again, sadly, reported as at risk uh, by two reports by the Earthquake Study Center in Barakli in 2010 and 2012. Mm -hmm. If we move to the next slide, uh, I think that we can also learn something from uh, these two buildings, again, collapsing in Barakli. On the top, we have the case of the Ilmaz Erbeck apartments consisting of two actually building, again, RC frames. Uh, now, these buildings, uh, you can see that the one on the right uh, collapsed with a local mechanism involving the first two floors. Instead, the one on the left remained stable. On the bottom, instead, we have the case of a complex of four buildings, the Barisitesi apartment. In this case, uh, we have that the three out of these buildings uh, collapsed 
again with the local mechanism involving different number stories and happening at different levels instead of the fourth one remained stable. So what we can say here again, maybe the soil had an effect, but we have to investigate also the reasons of the different behavior of these uh, similar buildings. Uh, so maybe the reason is not only the changes that the buildings had during the, 20, the last 20, 30 years of use, uh, but also maybe about the different qualities of the construction techniques and the material strength of the different um, um, uh, people that actually worked during the building of these structures. So if we want to actually have uh, an overview of the damage assessment in Izmir, we can actually see that we found an overall good behavior and performance of both RC buildings and measuring structures, maybe due to the recorded seismic action, and that uh, the most of the severe damage was related to the non-structural components and to uh, the pre-existing degradation in the material. And uh, when we found a catastrophic collapses seen by Rackley, actually the reasons can be different. For example, we have to look at the soil effects, but we can also think about the effects of poor maintenance, changes in the structural primary resistance systems, change of use of some parts of the buildings as well, poor detailing and poor material strength. So thank you very much. I think, Yasmin, you can continue from here. Thank you. Thank you, Marianne. Uh, yes, that was lovely. Um, in addition to these buildings that Anai and Marianne have mentioned, um, uh, I also we also wanted to basically discuss the Humish structures that you can see here. Uh, uh, and these are essentially some composite structures um, that, that, are, that are shown here uh, with a masonry ground floor and timber frame upper floors. These are common in Turkey, in Greece, and in part of the Balkans. The masonry ground floor can really be built um, in you know, multiple techniques, a stone, brick, with or without tie beams, uh, and um, and upper floors are, and all the partitions are built by uh, by these basically modular timber frames. Uh, and these can be either infilled with masonry or can be cladded, as you can see here. The infill typology can be single or double leaved, uh, and the material and the detailing used for these uh, varies from location to location. For instance, in Samos, we have mainly seen uh, the, the infill typologies with stone. Um, cladding, on the other hand, is done uh, in multiple ways as well. But you know, this is this is the most common technique: the Baadadi cladding. Um, when one uses um, two to four centimeter wide laths nailed onto the frame. This is, as you can imagine, a very light uh, weight typology, which has been shown to have very good intrinsic seismic resistance by past reconnaissance and experimental work. In these structures, regardless of the typology, the connections are, are, are built using nails, which are considered uh, to be the main energy dissipation source under earthquake loading. Uh, here you are seeing some pictures of this typology from Samos and, and Izmir area. Uh, interestingly, as, as Marco also mentioned, we actually uh, do not see any any damage to these structures in, in Izmir area, maybe just a you know full of plaster if that. Uh, but in some of we actually have observed some uh, some uh, significant uh, damages. And in light with in, in line with the previous literature, these were either initiated by the, the, the failure of the masonry components of the buildings or by an out-of-plane, uh, out um, essentially, failure of the infill walls. Uh, so with this, uh, quickly, uh, we conclude the structure section. And I'd like to invite you and us to speak about relief, response, and recovery, please. Thank you very much, Yasmin. Good evening, everyone. My name is Jonas Sels. I'm an architect uh, and PhD candidate in multi-hazard risk at UCL. Now, before I uh, begin, I'd like to quickly uh, give a, spe a special call out to Dr. Tolga Ozden and Danai Firtinidou uh, for um, playing central roles in uh, facilitating this mission. So starting in Izmir, there were 117 casualties, including one uh, from the tsunami and additional uh, plus 1,000 hospitalizations. Estimates as to the direct economic losses uh, are also shown on this page. And a key aspect to note uh, is that in Turkey, um, there is a system of mandatory earthquake insurance uh, under the preview of DASK. Uh, and it, which has 56% uh, market penetration in the Izmir area. Um, and it was also the first time uh, that insurance payouts uh, had been made uh, for tsunami damage. 
So uh, for the um, response to relief and recovery operations um, uh, in Izmir, um, they have been under the direct control and coordination of AFAD. Uh, and the uh, number of search and rescue uh, teams and personnel that you see there, 8,000. Uh, uh, that's interesting, a legacy of the 1999 uh, Izmit uh, earthquake. Uh, so there was a large deployment of uh, various search and rescue groups uh, at the scene. So a lesson I will call out relates to the compound disasters um, and the effects of uh, COVID-19. So COVID-19 uh, directly reduced the response capacity of first responders. One, we found that 60 to 70 firefighters were positive with COVID-19 at the time of the earthquake. Two, uh, COVID reduced the level of preparedness due to the reduced number of drills and uh, preparation measures taken uh, in, the, uh, in the months preceding the earthquake. Three, there was a reported spike in COVID cases amongst medical staff uh, in the following days. Um, and this can be attributed to difficulties in following COVID protocol um, uh, during the emergency. And four, it skewed the casualty distribution towards women and children, owing to the closures of schools following uh, local lockdown measures. Uh, in Samos, uh, there were two casualties uh, resulting from the earthquake and thankfully uh, none from the tsunami. Uh, so Greece does not have a mandatory earthquake insurance system in the same way Turkey does. Uh, rather, risk, uh, the risk transfer mechanism uh, instead operates uh, via the state. So a key aspect to highlight in Samos was that um, uh, was the issuing uh, for the first time a tsunami early warning uh, to the population. Uh, so on our right hand side, uh, we see the SMS uh, message, which was transmitted by the Civil Pro Protection Service uh, 24 minutes uh, after the earthquake. Uh, and this is in uh, Fathi, uh, in uh, a coastal town. Um, and uh, this was also nine minutes before the arrival of the second wave, uh, which, as uh, Marco mentioned, uh, produced the higher inundation levels. So a key challenge for uh, residents and emergency services was to evacuate people um, as traffic quickly congested escape routes. And the SMS is, um, uh, we, we, we discovered um, uh, create, generated a level of uh, panic. So, um, so as uh, uh, Yasmin mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, uh, we developed a set of surveys and interviews um, and these were developed uh, as part of the remote mission aimed at collecting data from first-hand uh, accounts. And within 72 hours, we obtained over uh, 1,000 responses, and uh, we're very excited to share some of uh, our initial findings. Uh, so from the surveys, uh, we gained uh, valuable insight into risk. Uh, um, so we uh, gained valuable insight into risk perception, sources of information, sources of information, tsunami early warning, and uh, disaster preventability. And for the interviews, uh, we aimed uh, to obtain lessons learned from key players uh, in the earthquake and tsunami response. For example, we learned that uh, what made the response in Sama so effective was the ra rapid escalation uh, up the command chain and the existence of um, established uh, response protocols. In Izmir, we learned that the uh, travel time of emergency respondents increased from a 20 minute journey to a two hour one. So some uh, example findings uh, of uh, the survey. So we found that uh, respondents in the Izmir region uh, gave a high likelihood um, of there being another significant earthquake within their lifetime. Respondents in Izmir also overwhelmingly attributed the causes of the disaster to poor construction and planning practices. In Samos, respondents felt that the principal issue was old and abandoned relic buildings. And another uh, um, uh, heartening um, uh, discovery we made was that pre uh, preparedness um, and uh, the education in uh, the Izmir region uh, regarding how to um, act during an earthquake uh, was saving lives. Uh, in terms of the tsunami preparedness, 
Uh, we gained insight into the perception of tsunami risk and pre preparedness. We also learned um, where people obtain most of their risk information. Uh, in Samos, for example, most people uh, obtain this information at school, whereas in Izmir, most people obtained their risk information from media sources. And critically, we learned that 57% of respondents received the tsunami warning uh, SMS, which I showed previously. Critically, 20% uh, said, uh, 20 said they received no warning at all, uh, and the others um, received it from uh, other people warning them, as well as uh, alarms and silence. Uh, thank you, and I will pass you back over to Yasmin. Thank you very much, Jonas. That's that's great. Um, I'd like to invite Diana now to talk about the social media analysis, please. Good evening, and thanks, Jasmine. My name is Diana Contreras, and research associate for Newcastle University for the project Learning from Earthquakes, and in charge of collecting data through social media for this mission. We have for this mission we have two main sources. Last quake and Twitter. In the case of La Last Quake, it's a crowdsourced based earthquake information app which uh, allows eyewitness to share information about earthquakes they felt. This app also combines seismic data. In the case of Twitter, using the hashtags identified through to social media monitoring the day of the earthquake, we purchased for a, for a third party vendor Twitter data. Last Quake app obtained a report from users mainly from Turkey and Greece, as it was expected. But also, there was a lot of report from Croatia, especially from a city called Sadar, followed by Bosnia and Herzegovina, Albania, Bulgaria, Romania, North Macedonia, and Serbia. Most comments were written in Turkish, followed by English, Croatian, German, Bosnian, and other languages. Still, some people use punctuation marks, social suspension points, questions and exclamation marks, and numbers reporting similar numbers to the magnitude of the earthquake, and three comments which language could, couldn't be identified. Now, focusing on the intensities reported by last quake up users in the case study area, the 64% of them reported a weak intensity, followed by light, moderate, not felt, moderate, strong, and very strong. We classified the comments from last quick app users in 10 relevant topics to the emergency or relief phase. And here we can see the three key topics for this mission. As the last quick app was designed to report intensities, the 90% of comments were related to this topic, followed by the description of the seismic movement horizontal and vertical coming from the bottom. Users also sent solidarity messages, wishing that everyone will be fine. They shared their emergency response measures, which, was ma which were mainly the evacuation of homes, but at least three people applied the theory of the triangle of life, and one person without the possibility to evacuate due to physical impediments decided to turn off the natural gas tap to protect him or herself. Others describe the damages on buildings and the effect of the tsunami. People recommend to others to provide themselves with a bottle of water while others ask how to stay safe. The user's comments were also useful to, useful to identify your reference damages in phone lines and the possibility of damages in power lines. No report of injuries or casualties were identified to the comments. Only 3% of the comments written by last week app users included pictures. From those comments with pictures, we selected 69% because some of them were repeated, others were pictures of TV screens, and at least four did not include proper coordinates. Here we have light those pictures taken in the case study area, which include comments. And, and next we can see on the vignettes those comments. Comments can be also classified according to the polarity in negative, neutral, and positive. 
In the case of an earthquake, most of the comet will have a negative polarity, and this case won't be the exception because the the most of the comments will contain message contain description of damage, fear, and anxiety, but there will be comments that provide information considered neutral, information related to the earthquake, and there will be comments with a, with a positive polarity that contains message of solidarity or news of people rescued from debris that will be classified as positive. Coming, coming to our second source of data, Twitter platform, the activity of Twitter reached a peak between 30 and 31st October. There was a small peak on the 11th of November because there was a fire in the refugee camp in Samos, and we still ha use the hashtag Samos. And there was one on the 28th of November, there was a minor earthquake on central Turkey. From this data, we can identify the most retweeted tweets and the most liked tweets. But of them are written in uh, originally in Turkish, and but the, you can see the translation to English already on the screen. Here we can see that the 89% of the tweets have an undefined polarity, followed by, followed by far but neutral, negative, and positive. This information usually is use, useful to know how bad the situation is going through the, uh, after the moment of the earthquake and through the time. Thank you very much. And this was the work on social media. Lovely. Thank you so much, Diana, and thank you all uh, for uh, staying with us up to this point. Uh, as you can see, a lot of work has gone into this mission, and we have a lot to say, even by way of uh, you know preliminary conclusions. But I am very cognizant of time, uh, and we have prepared these key messages. But probably at this point is going to be a little bit of a repetition. So I, I think I'm gonna I'm gonna skip just one thing that I'd like to reiterate again. Um, is the role of COVID uh, in, in all of these things. As, as Jonas also mentioned, uh, you know, this was a disaster amid an ongoing pandemic. And we saw that both countries did not actually have an earthquake emergency plan, which was suitably tailored for a pandemic condition. In Turkey, we have seen a steep rise and, uh, and, uh, and everything. Um, and another issue that I'd like to uh, expand a little bit on is that we, as I said, were not able to visit uh, inside the buildings for a more thorough building survey due to COVID, which may manifest as an underestimation of overall damage levels in, in our study. Uh, I'd like to quickly move on to what worked and what partly worked uh, for our mission. Uh, first of all, we do know working in the biggest team ever in the IFIT history worked wonders. I really must thank everyone uh, in the team for being absolutely fantastic in terms of uh, you know, how proactive and dedicated they were. Uh, so due to the remote assessment component, especially we needed to have really uh, a lot more work power. And so having a big team also um, was very advantageous uh, on that in that respect. Also, I'd like to attract your attention that we have worked with many early career researchers and students. We actually had two, nine PhD students, two master's students, one undergrad student and four researchers on, on our team. And uh, they have all been given leading roles and have demonstrated an absolutely wonderful performance. So I believe we really turned this mission into a capacity building exercise um, in, a, in a very good way. Uh, another thing that I'd like to mention is that it's really, um, quite important based on, based on our experience to train the field and remote team members responsible for damage assessments on the building stocks and damage state uh, attributions upfront. Um, I have actually put this under what worked section, but you know, we probably could have even done better in, in, the, in that, in that um, respect, because despite the fact that the IFITS mobile app actually helps a lot, um, you know, in standardizing the, 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 the outcome and the results, etc. Still, it is very useful for people to know what to expect in the field. Um, okay, so, and what partly worked? Uh, remote data, Diana already mentioned um, quite a lot, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna be very brief. Um, it is not easy to find. Um, in our case, it worked better for Greece than in Turkey. 
thanks to a few great work which we benefited from for good quality material we successfully used for, um, for remote damage assessment, uh, but it's not easy. Uh, in most cases, georeferencing doesn't exist, um, and it still leads to materials still perhaps usable for fragility analysis, etc., but not in for individual building assessment. Sometimes the georeferencing is there, but with two decimal points, let's say, so it really isn't quite helpful in identifying the exact location. But more importantly, the photos one can find yield really little useful, useful, usable visual material, both on a global global level, because most photos are focused on a few dramatic damage cases. So, for instance, you find this over and over and over again, and so uh, there is little diversity we find, especially in case of Turkey, and in on a basically individual basis, because you just end up with lots of lots of pictures like this where there is, a, there is a crack on the wall, but there is no context whatsoever. Uh, therefore, our experience is that relying on remote reconnaissance alone might not be an ideal way forward. However, I would like to um, uh, take this opportunity to, to tell you about this, uh, this lecture that's coming up on the 27th of January. Um, that is focused on the Zagreb mission. That's going to be uh, that's going to be that 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 was led by uh, by Emily So. So I really encourage you all to just go and join this this lecture because this is where the remote reconnaissance methods will be detailed extensively in a methodology and in a methodological fashion. Uh, and with these, I conclude my words. Um, these are some reports produced after the event and we used extensively. We are very grateful for grateful for all the groups who developed this material. Uh, and we have another long list of supporters and contributors um, here. Uh, we, of course, once again, thank our field crew and learning from Earthquakes team. And last but not least, the people of the both sides of the EGNC for supporting us. Uh, but if you needed to get in touch later with, with queries and questions, we'll be very pleased to answer them. Thank you very much. So let's have a look at this. Um, if it's mobile app looks great, is the data open and available to non EFIT members? Could Valentina please expand on this? Um, yes, uh, thanks for the, for the question, first of all. Um, the data can, um, well, obviously the, the app, you need to have a license uh, to join the, um, the organization. Uh, therefore, uh, data can be uh, made available under request. The data of the IG and mission can be made available under request. Uh, and the use of the app uh, upon having a license activated uh, is freely available. I hope that answers the question. Lovely. Thank you very much, Valentina. You're welcome. Uh, we have a, an interesting question here. When we conduct normal earthquake reconnaissance missions, the data is biased because we concentrate on failure rather than survival. Uh, I suspect failure bias is greater for remote missions. Do you have a sense of how different this bias may be between traditional and virtual missions? Yes, that's a very, very good point. Um, uh, and, and this is precisely why, as I was, I was explaining how we planned the fieldwork, I specifically uh, highlighted that we really told our field crew not to concentrate on uh, on damage, not to cherry pick damage, not to because we really wanted to have a have a reliable overall view of damage within the within the area. But I know that the the, the practices may differ from from mission to mission, and I completely agree with uh, with you that that the failure bias can be greater for remote missions for the exact reason that that I was mentioning uh, at the end because most of the visual material that you find uh, or descriptions that you find uh, online are very much focused on uh, the damage uh, so you, it is very hard I think if you do not have access to the field it is very difficult to actually have a balanced sense of the damage levels overall uh, in the affected areas. Um, another quick question. Uh, somebody is asking the experience of our field crew. Uh, can SR or and or Anul uh, expand on this a little bit, please? Anul. I'm Anul Koshka, a master student from 
Middle East Technical University. I contributed this valuable research as a field crew member with my uh, partner, Esar Chavuk. Uh, well, actually, we were always coordinated with the remote team when we in the field. Um, for Before that, we took some training about app upfront. Dear Enrique and Valentina explained deeply the way of the use of the app and K properties for informative data input. Uh, it was a simple and powerful tool to evaluate the damaged buildings fastly in disaster areas. Really helped us on the field due to easy use and its properties. I believe that it helps a lot of engineers and research, researchers that want to use, especially especially it's a valuable app due to it has deep selection of details of investigate the buildings in the field such as tsunami option, a large selection of filling parts for a better understand uh, the anatomy of the damaged buildings. Um, we generally uh, investigated uh, and collected uh, data uh, in the large areas of Izmir. I must add, it was a really large area to investigate in five days, but uh, Professor Yasemin Aktash, she helps us uh, in every situation and guide us through our field investigate uh, journey, no matter what. Generally, non-structural uh, damages are observed, plus and coating cracks. The type of cracks that uh, horizontal vertical cracks and pierce and spandlers, diagonal cracks in the edge of openings such as window and building entrance, uh, buildings uh, of entrance doors. Uh, we generally couldn't enter the buildings. Uh, we make our assessment from outside the buildings. Uh, of course, that uh, may be misleading in some cases, but uh, compared to Bayrakla and Bornova, there are no uh, heavily structural damage in the building. Uh, and also masonry buildings are not greatly damaged in uh, those areas. Um, so to sum up with this uh, magic device application, it was uh, fun and uh, easy to assess and investigate the structural uh, damages. And, and that's it, I think. <laughs> Maybe you. Esther uh, wants something to add. Uh, and also thank you for the, all the presenters uh, for their uh, valuable times and their efforts uh, to make this uh, AFIT mission uh, a great one. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Anul. That's, that's really lovely. Thank you so much for your answer. Um, okay. Yavuz Yurtman is asking, um, how accurate is the geological maps showing the, showing the major and minor fault lines around uh, Izmir? Um, can Ashling maybe say a few words about this? Um, yeah. He's particularly referring to one to five thousand uh, scale maps, Ashling. Um, yeah, I, I've basically taken um, uh, it's known as the GM like at fault map, like a global study, purely from uh, looking at a wider point of view. Um, when I brought up the local um, seismicity slide, then that's when I showed the more um, local studies that m my colleagues um, have mapped in the field, such as along the Western Turkey. So um, I have those databases if anyone wants to use them. But on a local scale, we have we have mapped it accurately, but on the regional maps, it's um, a lot of the smaller ones were left off. Yeshim Biro is saying that the Hazar Tespit the Ministry's um, damage assessment site is not accessible from Switzerland at, uh, at the moment. Uh, well, we had the same problem on and off, uh, Yeshim. Um, it just comes back if you wait long enough. Um, I guess that's the only thing um, I can tell. Okay, lovely. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for joining us uh, tonight. And apologies for an overly long uh, lecture. Please get in touch if there are any questions that you uh, you'd like to ask. And thank you very much to the team as well. Good evening.